Okay, thank you, Jody and Dennis, for the uh, for the nice introduction there, um, and thanks everybody for coming today. I'm looking at the numbers um, on Zoom, and it looks like there's quite a few of you. So, um, uh, I, I appreciate your your interest in the multi species occupancy models. Um, I did see a couple notes in the chat, and I want to address how to download these files from GitHub real quick um, in a in a reasonably efficient way, um, and. Um, before I move on to, to my talk as well. Um, so um, Dennis provided a link to GitHub, and I think the link should bring you to this page right here, which is the, the multi-species occupancy modeling folder that I posted. If you wanna download everything efficiently in one step rather than file by file, go up a level in the hierarchy. So click on the statistical method seminar series link. This will bring you to the whole GitHub um, um, site for um, for these talks. And then if you click on this code drop down box here, you have the option to download it as a zip. Now what this is going to do is it's actually going to download all of the files. Um, but once you unzip it, you can access these folders uh, individually. Um, and this is not such a big file here that it should take you long to download everything here. Um, but this is a, a quick efficient way for those of you um, that say don't have GitHub desktop or something like that to, to be able to download and access the files um, that I will be using today. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so the way that um, uh, I'd like to, to, to work through this today is Zoom, um, you know, just allows me to share one screen at a time. Um, and so you'll see on, on the one screen here, I've got my slides and this has some code in it. And then I've actually got an R um, um, session open um, on the other screen. Um, and I'm basically going to copy and paste and execute the code from my presentation into R so that I can make sure that I'm going at an appropriate pace uh, for all you folks to follow. And so that we can see this code being executed um, in real time. So I will switch back and forth between the two of these. Um, a couple of um, packages that you might want to have installed if you don't have it already uh, would be unmarked. Um, we will be using um, unmarked in here. And if you want to follow along with some of the graphing, um, consider having ggplot2 um, installed uh, as well. Um, but all the code, all the results, all the figures are available on the, um, on the slides um, that I have up on, on GitHub as well. Okay. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for attending. I'm, I'm really excited to be here um, today. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was an honor to have been invited to, to participate. Um, and what I'd like to talk today um, about is uh, multi-species occupancy models um, and some of, the, um, some of the models that uh, uh, myself and others um, um, have been working on developing. So right out of the gate, I wanna make sure that I acknowledge that this has been um, um, work that has been conducted by, by a lot of folks. Um, um, I've got a lot of co-authors on, on some of these papers, um, so I, I'm not going to shout out to all of these co-authors right now, although we'll link some of their papers throughout the talk. Um, but I got to give a big thanks to Ken Kellner um, at SUNY ESF. Um, Ken um, was the one responsible for putting all of the multi-species occupancy modeling code into unmarked. If it wasn't for Ken, I would probably be sharing raw functions with everybody um, still that wanted to, to apply this model. So big thanks to Ken for implementing this um, in Unmarked. Um, and then of course, big thanks to Roland Kays, Ariel Parsons. Um, they got me um, um, all of the data that we'll be using um, for the example today, but they provided lots of the data and lots of the motivating ideas for what we'll be talking about um, in the, the workshop today. So big picture, what are um, the multi-species occupancy models? What do they allow us uh, to do? Um, what they allow us to do is model occupancy probability of multiple species simultaneously. Um, and for many of the types of surveys that we're all doing out there, uh, we're not just collecting survey data on one species uh, or two species at a time, right? When we have game cameras, we're, we're um, uh, collecting data on you know entire mammalian communities, sometimes more than just mammals. When we're doing point count surveys for birds, we're often detecting the entire suite of avian species out there. And so we're collecting multi-species data, and it only makes sense that we'd want to model that, um, that multi-species data. Um, multi-species occupancy models allow us to infer patterns of dependence between species, right? So is this species more likely to occur at a site that also has um, 
uh, another species, or maybe there's competition between species. And so the presence of one species might preclude um, the presence um, of another species. Um, so these multi-species occupancy models allow us to infer patterns of dependence. I should make clear um, right out of the gate that with these occupancy models, we're getting at patterns, right? Um, and we should be very clear that pattern doesn't imply process. Um, just because two species are correlated at the site doesn't mean that it's interspecific dependence by itself that's, that's causing the correlation. It could be unmodeled environmental heterogeneity, um, for example. But for the kind of modeling we're doing, um, detection, non-detection, um, this is at least a good way to start to account for some of that dependence that might be occurring between species. And occupancy models implies that we're doing this while accounting for imperfect um, detection. So the models we'll talk about today allow us to perform formal tests for dependence between species, where you can get a test statistic and a p-value if that's what you want to do, where you can compare models that have um, species interactions with models that assume independence between species, and you could use some sort of model selection procedure to have a formal test for dependence. Um, but these models will allow you to, to, to evaluate that dependence. The models that I'll be discussing today ask um, allow us to ask whether those interactions will vary along some kind of a gradient, okay? So are species more likely to interact, say, in urban areas than in non-urban areas, um, for example, okay? So we not only can look for dependence between species, but we can see how it varies along some sort of environmental um, gradient. This allows us to get at both marginal and conditional occupancy probabilities, and I'll have a slide a little later where we discuss this in greater detail. But we can think of marginal occupancy probability is what's the probability that just this species occurs at some site. And then conditional occupancy probability, we can say, given that you know, we have species B and C at a site, what's the probability that species A will be at a site? Okay. So the multi-species occupancy models allow us to get at both those marginal and conditional occupancy probabilities. And we can also ask questions about whether occurrence at a site is more strongly driven by the presence or absence of some competing species or some environmental gradient that might determine the species occupancy. So there's lots of things that we can learn from these uh, multi-species occupancy models, and we'll get at some of this. Uh, we'll get at some of this today. Now, uh, there's there's a whole bunch of flavors of multi-species occupancy modeling. Um, and in fact, I could probably teach an entire three semester course just on multi-species occupancy models because there's so many out there. And I have an hour today to talk to you guys. Um, so um, I'm gonna touch on some of the other approaches that are out there and then I'm gonna ignore them. Um, there's a whole bunch of two species occupancy models um, that are out there. These are some of the earliest multi-species occupancy models um, that were developed. Um, they often require some sort of asymmetric interaction Okay, so we might have some dominant species that controls whether some other species is, is present or absence, but it's some kind of an asymmetrical interaction that's occurring, okay? There's a whole bunch of, of models out there that allow for more than two species. Um, um, these are often um, able to account for 40, 50, 60 species at a time. Um, and often what we're getting at with these kinds of multi-species occupancy models is pairwise correlation, often um, through some sort of a covariance matrix. The presence of this species um, co-varies uh, with the presence of some other species, okay? So there's several papers out there um, that look at many, many species um, all at once, okay? There's another flavor of multi-species occupancy modeling that isn't specifically looking at correlations between species, um, but we think we can kind of think of it as a random effects approach to multi-species occupancy modeling where we borrow strength from those species that we have lots of observations on to draw inference on species that might occur relatively infrequently uh, within, uh, infrequently within the community, okay? Um, and so the, the multiple species are, are linked through random effects. Um, and then there's also a whole suite of species richness multi-species occupancy models, where often with these, we're interested in saying how many species occur in the entire community and we're accounting for species that were never detected. Um, and there's a whole suite of models, um, multi-species occupancy models that might be focused on, on species richness uh, type questions. 
I'm not gonna talk about any of those today beyond what I already have. Um, today's talk is going to be focused on techniques um, that I originally published uh, in 2016, and I, I, I followed up on that with several publications um, since then. I will note that throughout, um, uh, at least the papers um, uh, that come out of my lab group or that I'm a co-author on, I link um, in my talk so you guys can follow these links if you want to find the papers. Um, so for example, I'll click on that and it'll bring you to my, my paper if you want to get more details. Okay, so it'll be easy to find them from within the talk. Now, where does, where does my um, uh, paper fall within this hierarchy? I say it falls kind of right here between the two species and the greater than two species. In principle, um, the model I'll talk about today can, can handle an arbitrary number of species, but in practice, it's limited to a relatively small number of species, three, four, five, six species. And principally, when you're using this technique to look at those relatively smaller communities, you're, you're looking at those interactions uh, in greater detail. Okay, so you're looking beyond just pairwise correlations, but you might ask, do these interactions vary along some sort of an environmental gradient? Okay. All right. So I'm going to get into some technical details um, that I think are necessary before we get into some code and interpreting some, some model output. I don't think I include any math in this talk, and, and that's on purpose. Um, this is this is a, a very um, slimmed down version um, of a full day workshop that I give. Um, and in that workshop, I'll, I'll, I'll give uh, equations and whatnot. Um, here, I'm going to give I'm going to try to give some big picture ideas, and then you guys can can go back if you want some of the mathematical details and look in um, uh, some of my publications uh, on the topic. But there's at least a few big ideas that I think we need to have in mind before we move on to actually um, fitting um, and, uh, and interpreting these models. One of the big ideas is the, this idea of, of natural parameters, or what we call natural parameters in our multi-species occupancy models. And these are essentially different submodels within our occupancy model that account for different kinds of, of occupancy. Okay, so we have what we might call our first order natural parameters. Okay, and these are the models that account for one species at a time, hence first order. Okay, now technically, these are models that look at log odds of species occurrence conditional on the absence of all the other species um, within your um, model that you're looking at. Okay. So what are the variables that affect just that one species all by itself? Okay, so these are our first order natural parameters. We've got second order natural parameters, and these are the natural parameters that account for pairwise correlations between species. Pairwise correlations between species one and two, between species one and three, between species two and three, for example. Technically, these um, second order natural parameters are the change, the difference in log odds that species, one of these species will occur when the other species is present relative to when that other species is, is absent, okay? We can include um, intercept only models on these second order natural parameters just to say, all right, are these two species correlated? We can include linear models on these second order natural parameters to ask how that correlation varies along an environmental gradient. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about these natural parameters when we get into interpreting model output um, before too long here, okay? A couple of uh, technical details on those second order natural parameters. I said I didn't include any math, but I, I lied, but this is, this is easy enough. Um, okay, so um, the number of natural parameters is gonna depend on how many species you're modeling in your multi-species occupancy model. So you're always gonna have S, first order natural parameters where S is the number of species um, that you are modeling here, okay? And that makes sense um, because you've got S species and then you wanna be able to, to talk about what are the um, variables influencing that species all by itself, okay? We have S choose two second order natural parameters. These are those pairwise natural parameters um, that I was alluding to earlier. Pairwise interactions between species one and two, two and three, 
one and three. Okay. And in fact, we can have up to two raised to the s minus one natural parameters, okay, of maximum order s. Okay. So if we have 10 species in our community, we can have these 10th order natural parameters. I've never fit a model that had a 10th order natural parameter because they're really, really hard to interpret. Okay. I tend to limit them to first or, or second order natural parameters. Um, and just because you have four species in your model doesn't mean you need to include all of these natural parameters. And in fact, you can, and I'll show you how to fix some of those higher order natural parameters at zero if, if you so desire to build a more parsimonious model. Okay, so let's have an example with uh, S equals three species because the example we'll work through today, I think just has three species, okay? So we've got those three first order natural parameters. We've got three choose two second order natural parameters. Okay, one for each pairwise combination. We have three choose three first, um, three choose three third order natural parameters or just one of the third order natural parameters for a total of seven potential natural parameters within, uh, within our model. But just because we can have that many doesn't mean we should use that many, okay? And in most cases, especially when we have more and more species, we probably shouldn't. And in fact, for this talk, I'm only gonna talk about first and second order natural parameters. I'll show you how to fix those higher natural um, higher order natural parameters at zero, so you don't have to worry about them, but I'll also show you how to um, estimate them if you so desire. Right. Natural parameters, one of the technical details. Another technical detail that we're gonna talk about is marginal occupancy probability, okay? Um, this is how we often think about occupancy probability, especially when you've got just the single species that you're interested in, okay? Um, so this is the probability that that one species occurs regardless of all the other species. And it's not that we're ignoring all the other species, um, but what we're actually doing is, is summing over um, um, all the other species and calculating our marginal occupancy probability for one species all by itself, okay? This is a complex function of your nat natural parameters. If you want the mathematical details, you can go to my paper where we, where we lay this out. Um, but the important point here is that your marginal occupancy probability is not actually obtained from your model output. One of the wonderful things that Ken Kellner has done for us in implementing this package um, in Unmarked is make it so that you don't have to calculate this by hand at all. And in fact, the model will calculate it for you. But it's important to recognize that you're not going to obtain marginal occupancy probability directly from the model output. Um, that there's some, some, some calculations going on in the background um, that I will show you guys how to implement within Unmarked. Okay. Um, and I think I said everything else on here as well. Okay. So marginal occupancy, one species averaging over all of the other species that you've included in your model when calculating that marginal occupancy probability. We're gonna contrast that now with conditional occupancy probability, okay? Conditional occupancy probability is when we wanna ask, how does occupancy probability of one species, in this case, the bobcat, change when we assume another species is present or absent, okay? Um, so in some cases, this, in some very specific cases, we can get conditional occupancy probability directly from our model output, okay? So for example, the output for those first order natural parameters that we'll, we'll see here in, in a few minutes um, can be directly interpreted as conditional occupancy probability. For those first order natural parameters, so those natural parameters that only apply to one species at a time, that's the occupancy probability of species A, B, or C, conditional on the absence of all other species, okay? So we're looking solely at what are the um, environmental influences for this one species um, all by itself, okay? In other cases, conditional occupancy probability can be a really complex function of those natural parameters, okay? The good news is you guys don't actually have to do those calculations by hand if you don't want to. Um, Ken has done a beautiful job implementing these in, in unmarked. 
Um, and for those of you who are interested in the details, you can find those details in our in our 2016 uh, paper as well. Okay. So conditional occupancy probability. What's the probability that one species will be at a site conditional on the presence or absence of the other species that are included in your model? Okay, and with that, we'll talk quickly about the basic sampling procedure, um, just so we're on the, the same page with, with some notation here. Uh, now, this is the same general procedure um, from a technical standpoint from single season occupancy models. Um, so we're surveying um, at N sites um, that we have selected from some population of interest. Um, and we're not going to talk about how to select those sites. We'll assume these N sites represent some random sample from some population um, of interest. Okay. So at each of those sites, which you might index by um, I, we'll conduct some big J number of replicate surveys. Okay. And um, I subscript J by I, meaning that we don't have to, to do the exact same number of replicate surveys at every one of our sites. Some sites can have more replicate surveys um, than another, but these replicate surveys are fundamental for being able to separate the detection process from the occupancy process. So we need to be doing these, these replicate surveys. Again, it's up to you and your system how best to conduct these replicate surveys. Just as with single species occupancy models, closure is important here. So these should be conducted over a, a period of time where we can um, maximize the likelihood that our sites are indeed um, closed to changes in occupancy. Okay. And then for each species at each of those replicate surveys at each site, we're going to record whether a species is detected um, or not detected. So if it's detected, we denote this with a one. And if it's not detected, we denote it with a zero. Okay. Um, and then we can record um, those detection level covariates. These are those covariates that can change um, between replicate surveys. These are covariates that we tend to think of as influencing detection probability, time of day, weather, et cetera. Things that can change between our replicate surveys. And then we also record site level covariates at each site. These are the covariates that we um, assume influence occupancy probability. And we assume that these covariates are constant um, over the course of, of sampling. This might be something like, um, elevation or some kind of a, um, a treatment um, that you have applied or a control that you've applied um, uh, in your study population, okay? So basically the same as single species occupancy models, except for now we're sampling um, a, a larger uh, ecological community. So we're gonna shift gears now from uh, talking about um, kind of the high level overview, um, some of the technical details, and we're actually gonna get into implementation um, of this model uh, in Unmarked. Again, I gotta thank uh, Dr. Kellner um, for, for, for implementing this and continuing to maintain this um, in Unmarked. Um, he did a lot of heavy lifting to make this really accessible to um, a, a wide audience. Um, now within Unmarked, as we were talking about getting this uh, implemented, I, I, I um, had some ideas and we really wanted to make sure that this had similar syntax to the other models that are already um, included in the unmarked so it would be relatively familiar um, and easy for folks to pick up on. Um, but there are some important details given the number of natural parameters one can fit with this model um, um, that make this a little bit different from some of the other uh, models within unmarked. Okay. So let's first review our example data set, um, and then we'll get this um, the, these data formatted um, for analysis uh, within Unmarked. Okay. All right, so this is where I have to uh, give a shout out to, to Roland um, and Ariel and all of the um, eMAML, uh, Wildlife Insights camera tracking folks. Um, this is a, a large data set um, uh, that, that um, Roland and his crew uh, largely collected. Um, using citizen science techniques. We've got, we've got data from 1,437 camera traps placed across this, these six states kind of throughout the, uh, the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, we've got cameras um, uh, from Maryland um, down to Tennessee, North Carolina, um, and, and South Carolina. Now, these cameras were placed in parks and protected areas. Um, and these dots here represent the parks and protected areas. And then we've got a, a zoomed in um, area here that shows the placement of cameras within 
um, those, uh, those protected areas. Um, I distilled this entire huge data set to three species, bobcats, uh, coyotes, and uh, red fox. Um, and I furthermore distilled um, these data to three replicate sampling periods such that it would be easy to use these data for, for presentations like this, okay? So on, on average, the target was to deploy these cameras for three weeks at a time. Sometimes they're deployed longer, sometimes they're deployed less longer. We cleaned these data up when um, preparing them for these workshops. Um, and what we did is we assumed that one week was a replicate sampling period. So if any of these um, target species was detected on a camera at least once, during any of those one week periods, we recorded them as detected. If we didn't detect them at all during um, any of those one week periods, um, they got a zero um, and they were um, not detected, okay? Um, we've got um, a lot of covariates and I actually distilled the covariates um, on this data set as, as well, but we have several site level occupancy covariates. So those um, covariates that are assumed to stay the same um, at every site. Um, and then we've got some observation level detection covariates um, as well. Um, and um, if you guys want the details um, um, of, of the sampling uh, and the data, you know, you can find that in, in KZL 2016. This is a paper um, that we published in Journal of Applied Ecology. Okay, so that's a high level overview of the data we'll be using for um, today's uh, workshop. And, and what I'm gonna do now, um, you, you can see that I've kind of got the split screen here, um, is I am going to um, jump back and forth between my presentation here and some R code here so I can make sure that I'm not going too fast um, for you guys. Um, but the, 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 the code should be able to be executed as is, as long as you've got the appropriate working directory set um, for, um, for R. But let me close out of this real quick. Hide loading meeting controls. So I'm gonna open up a new R script and um, I have already navigated to the folder that I wanna set as, as my working directory. Um, if you guys downloaded that um, entire GitHub um, repository and then um, navigated to uh, my folder in there, um, you should be able to just, um, set that folder as your working directory. Okay, it's gonna be a little bit different for everybody, but um, from here on out, I'm assuming that you've got the appropriate working directory set so that you can read in those data, okay? Um, oh, let's take a step backwards. Now I should be able to just copy and paste, assuming I didn't make any silly errors. Um, data from my presentation um, into an R text file. And all I'm doing here is um, reading in um, those uh, detection, non-detection data for our three species, bobcat, coyote, and, um, and red fox. You'll notice here that I set the header equal to false um, because the CSV that I have doesn't actually have a header. It's just all ones and zeros. And the first row um, in that CSV represents the first um, site, okay? So let's execute this. Um, on my end, I'm just pressing um, control and enter. Okay, and I was able to execute those just fine um, uh, because I have the working directory set correctly and I've got all the data in this data folder. So let's just inspect really quick um, one of these sets of detection, non-detection data. I chose to inspect the Fox data um, because um, that was the, the only one that had some detections um, in the first several rows, okay. Um, so we've got three columns, one column for each of our um, replicate surveys. Um, and then we have 1,437 rows, one row for each site. Um, but I've only displayed the first six here so that we don't take up all of the space in the console down here. And on site six, for example, we detected coyotes during, or uh, red fox during all three weeks. Um, on site three here, we only detected them during the third week at that site, and then we didn't detect them at all uh, at any of the other camera sites, okay? 
So um, we read in our, our multi-species data, one um, data frame at a time, one matrix um, at a time, okay? So there is our detection, non-detection data. Okay. Next, we've got our site level covariate data. Remember, these are the covariates that vary only by site, but we assume they're constant for the duration of the survey. Those data are also in the same data folder that are provided um, on GitHub. Okay. Now these data do have a header on them. So um, um, I assume the first line of that CSV file is the column names. And let's, let's make this a little bit bigger so we can see that better. Let's just look at the first several rows of these occupancy covariates um, as well. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Try zooming in so everybody can see. I think this will be all right. Okay. Um, so we have uh, several different covariates here, dist underscore 5km, hdens underscore 5km, latitude, longitude, trail, okay. Um, on the next slide here, I describe what all of these site level covariates mean. So this dist underscore 5km, this is the proportion um, of an area within a five kilometer radius that's disturbed, um, say from um, uh, human uh, development, maybe a subdivision. Um, the details are in um, that case at all manuscript that I uh, referenced earlier. HDENS underscore 5km, that's the housing density uh, within five kilometers. Latitude and longitude are exactly what they sound like. Um, although I believe here that we divide them by um, 100. Um, people underscore site. So this is the total people recorded at a camera trap site divided by a thousand. And then trail is just a binary indicator of whether the camera was on a trail or, or off a trail, okay? Now, one thing you'll notice um, from these data is that I don't actually center and scale them. Uh, I debated whether to do this for the talk or not, and I decided not to center and scale them. Um, it's always good practice to center and scale your data, and you'll see that we're gonna have kind of some big slope coefficients um, as a consequence of failing to center and scale some of these. Um, uh, so, Note that I don't do it here, but it is good practice to do it in the future. I just didn't want to overly complicate things for a, um, a one hour talk. Okay, those, those are our site level covariates. And then we've got our detection covariates as well. I'm just gonna read in one detection covariate for this talk. Okay. So here's our detection covariates. And let's take a look at the first several rows of those. Now, the way these are structured is we've got one row for every site. So we've got 1,437 rows and we have one column for every replicate survey, okay? Um, and this is some measure of temperature averaged over, averaged over that one week period. Um, um, and I don't remember if this was average high temperature or what, I have to dive into the case at all citation to get that exact um, reference, but this is um, um, temperature averaged over some, some one week replicate survey period. Um, and more broadly for the, for, the, for the sake of this talk, it's just meant to represent a detection level covariate that can change from survey um, to survey. All right. So detection, non-detection data, site level covariate data, um, uh, survey level covariate data or detection data. All of those are now um, loaded in. Um, and the next step is to format them in such a way um, that they can be read by um, uh, the, the functions in Unmarked uh, that we will use, okay? Um, all right here. Don't click on any code yet um, at this point. Uh, for those of you that have unmarked already installed, the best thing to do 
um, is just to execute um, this code here to uh, make sure you've got uh, the unmarked library um, loaded into your R session. Okay. Now, what I wanna say is that um, the version that you can download from CRAN will be sufficient for almost everything that we're going to do today. Um, at the end of the talk today, I'm gonna to break the model a little bit. I'm gonna show you something that students commonly do. Um, and I'm gonna show you how to fix that problem um, as well uh, using um, a penalized likelihood. Um, the latest version of CRAN does not yet have the um, penalized likelihood implemented. Though if you want to, um, um, install the latest version of, of, of Unmarked that does have this penalized likelihood. I've got some code right here um, for you guys to download it directly from um, uh, the Unmarked uh, GitHub site. Now this takes a little while to, um, to install on your computer, so I don't recommend trying to do it right now, um, but perhaps after the talk, you guys can go through um, and do that if this is something that, that interests you, okay? Um, now this latest version, um, this penalized likelihood will be available um, the next um, CRAN release of, of, of Unmarked, um, but it's, it's, it's not there yet. It's because the paper is hot off the press. I think we just got it published in December of last year. Okay, so we've loaded the Unmarked package. Yep, all right. So now we're gonna think about formatting data. And we'll think about this first from a high level, and then we'll actually give you guys the how you do um, format um, the data uh, in unmarked. Um, so like lots of the other um, functions within um, unmarked, it wants this unmarked frame object, okay? Now the object that we're using um, for, for, for today's model is an unmarked frame OccuMulti um, for a multi-species occupancy model, okay? And it's gonna want data much like all the other unmarked frame objects want data for those of you that are familiar um, with, uh, with Unmarked. So we're gonna supply detection, non-detection data. And this will be a list of matrices. And we'll have um, um, one element of that list will correspond to one species, okay? We're gonna have site level covariates that we'll specify just as a straight up data frame. And then we're gonna have detection level covariates and this will be a list of data frames and each element to the, of that list will correspond to one of your um, detection level covariates, okay? And these will all go into an unmarked frame ocu multi object, okay? So there's the high level overview. Um, and here's how we actually do this um, within R, okay? So I'm gonna copy and paste this Y list Okay, um, let's see how that looks when I paste it here. So this is a list, okay, um, with one element per species. Um, now each element in, um, in that list has to be a matrix, okay? And um, when we imported our detection on detection data, it came in as a, as a data frame. That's the behavior of the read.csv function. But it's really easy to take that data frame and just convert it to a matrix. There's a function called as.matrix, okay? Um, and so for each element of this um, detection list, um, we're gonna convert those data frames to a matrix. And if you want to, and I highly encourage doing this, we're going to name each element of that list so that those names come through into your model output and you know what those natural parameters, what species those natural parameters are corresponding to, okay? Um, so we're gonna execute this line of code here and it's gonna give us a nice list, one element for each species, each element is a named matrix, okay? And I guess if I wanted to, I could apply the head function here and you could see what that would look like. all the time, okay. Yeah, that's too big. That's why I didn't do it earlier. Um, but you can see that we've got our matrices in here that are named. Okay. What else do we have happening here? Oops. Excellent. 
So there's our detection, non-detection data. The next thing we're doing is placing our detection covariates also into a named list, okay? And I've copied the code for doing that right here. Put that into our R session here. We'll call that DET underscore list for detection list. Again, a list, and it's gonna be a named list. I highly encourage you to name this list so that you know what covariates you're referencing. And here you can just put the data frame that you imported directly um, into that list, okay? Um, now, importantly, each element of that list has to have the same dimensions as each element of your detection, non-detection list, okay? You have to have the same number of rows, one for each site, and you have to have the same number of columns, one for each replicate survey, okay? Um, and then you use the name TEMP in this case, or the name that you provided in that list when referencing this covariate later on in your model, okay? So there we are reading in our detection list or our list of detection covariates. Now we don't have any, we have, don't have to do anything fancy with our site level covariates um, because um, unmarked frame multi, OcuMulti can take um, that's directly as a data frame. And the only requirement there is that it has one row for every um, site, okay? So now that we've got our detection, non-detection data and our detection covariates um, in the right format, we're gonna read everything into our unmarked frame OcuMulti object. And the code for doing that is here. We're going to call this MSOM data, multi species occupancy model data. The function in unmarked is called unmarked frame OcuMulti. Um, and as always, if you guys ever want um, um, to, I do this all the time. It's just a habit when even on functions that I recognize all the time, um, I pull up the help menu just so I can remember what the arguments are, what order they're in, et cetera. Okay. Um, an easy way to do this if you're using our studio is just to place your cursor um, between the last letter of, of the function name and the, uh, and, the, and the parentheses, press F1, and you'll see that you'll get the help menu over here. I'm not going to go through the help menu, um, but um, I always bring this stuff up, and I tell my students there's no shame in always looking at the help menu when you're applying these functions. Okay. So we're going to use the unmarked frame OcuMulti function, and the arguments that we're going to specify our Y for our detection, non-detection data. Site codes, these are our site level covariates. Okay. And OBS codes for observation covariates. Um, and this is our list of um, detection covariates. Okay. Execute this function real quick. Now we've got our, um, our data properly formatted for analysis in, in unmarked. All right. Okay, so data is formatted. We're ready to get into an intercept only model. We'll fit the simplest model um, that we can um, at this point, and then we'll start building on complexity. Okay. Um, intercept only, assuming independence. This is basically the same thing as fitting three occupancy models, um, three single species occupancy models. Um, by assuming independence between uh, species. Okay, so we've got similar syntax to other models in unmarked, um, but we've also got to tweak this uh, a little bit because there's substantially more parameters um, that one could estimate with this model. Okay. So in this case, we've got three species, and so we have to have a detection formula for each species. Okay. Furthermore, we have an occupancy formula for each natural parameter. Okay, so this is where it diverges from, say, the single species occupancy models, where you just have one um, formula for the, the detections and one formula for occupancy. Here we have one formula for every natural parameter, and this is where we got to do some bookkeeping, but it's also important to understand what those natural parameters are and how many of them are, are potentially included in your model. Okay, so because we have so many um, different formulas that we can provide, um, uh, we determined that the best way to do this in unmarked was as a character vector, okay? 
and each element of that character vector corresponds to a different model. Okay. And then the order follows um, the order of your detection, non detection list, right? So if you remember, um, I had you guys name these species as you were putting the detection, non detection data into your list. Um, so the order would be bobcat, coyote, and red fox as you read these formulas in. Okay. Right. So here is some code for fitting just the um, um, intercept only model that includes, uh, that assumes um, independence between species, okay? So we've got our character vector of detection level formulas here, okay? One element for each species. We've got a character vector for our state formulas here. These are for our natural parameters, okay? And I've got um, three of those as well. And you're gonna be like, whoa, wait a minute. I thought there was gonna be seven natural parameters in this model um because you've got three species um and the truth is well this is this is a, a handy thing that, that that ken threw in here we can set the maximum order of those natural parameters um such that everything above that natural um that maximum order is fixed at zero so here we're saying max order equals one this means that i only want to look at those first order natural parameters or those single species natural parameters. I'm gonna ignore second and third order. So this explicitly um, assumes that these species occur independently um, at each site. And then finally, we tell it um, to look for our data in this msom underscore data object. So let's fit this real quick. Okay. Took a second. And they'll get a little bit longer to fit um, the more uh, models we have. Um, that went quickly enough. Okay. This is what the output would look like. And I think it'll actually be easier to, to inspect this output from um, this screen here rather than the R console. Um, but hopefully, at least for those of you that have fit occupancy models before, um, this should be, um, this should look relatively familiar. Okay. And in fact, this should be equivalent to fitting three um, single species occupancy models um, for each of these species. Okay, so here we would have the log odds um, occurrence of bobcat, coyote, red fox um, at each of our sites, uh, and here we would have um, the log odds detection conditional on the species um, being present during any of our uh, detection non detection surveys. Okay. You can see that these are nicely named um, and these names correspond to the names that you put into that list. Okay. Um, and it shows lots of the other information that one comes to expect from um, uh, unmarked um, AIC, number of sites, and then some uh, convergence uh, criteria that are reported um, as well. Okay. Um, hopefully you all got this to work because we're going to move on now to fitting um, more more complicated models next okay so here's the intercept only model assuming independence next we're going to move on to um, still an intercept only model but now we are going to incorporate dependence between species okay so start to get at actually some of the cool stuff that these multi-species occupancy models can do we're going to have to make two tweaks in order to do this, the, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set our max order equals two. Okay, so this is telling the model that we want to now allow those second order natural parameters. We want to allow those natural parameters that allow for pairwise correlations between species. Okay, um, so we're going to set max order equal two, so we can estimate those second order natural parameters, and we're going to include a few more uh, formulas as well. And we're going to include one formula for each of those natural parameters, okay? If you remember from the beginning there, there's, um, in this case, there's three species, there's um, second order natural parameters. And so there's three choose two different um, possibilities here, one for each pairwise combination, okay? Let's take this code, let's execute this code. Make sure I don't get any silly errors here. Notice that this one's taking, oh, that one didn't take all that long. 
couple seconds. Okay. Let's jump back here and now look at some output. So now we've got some additional output corresponding to those second order natural parameters. Okay. So let's take some time to inspect this a little bit more, a little bit more closely. Here we've got output from our first order natural parameters. So log odds that the bobcat would occur at a site conditional on all other species being absent from that site. Okay. Same with coyote, same with red fox. Now we've got our pairwise natural parameters, okay? What's the change in log odds in one of these species when the other is present relative to when the other is absent, okay? So we'll, 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 we'll take some time to inspect this in a little bit of detail. For one, the, the, the slope coefficient here is positive. So that means a bobcat is more likely to occur at a site if a coyote is also at that site, okay? Whereas a bobcat is less likely to occur at a site that has a red fox present because this is a negative coefficient, okay? And that difference in log odds is what this coefficient represents. Furthermore, if we wanted to um, do null hypothesis significance testing, we could look at the p-value here, and we can see that all of these p-values are very small, much lower than 0 0.01. Um, and so we could say there is a significant um, interaction between these two species, if, if, if that's the way um, that you like to interpret these models, okay? And then our detection interpretation of everything is all the same. So I include all of this information down here that I just um, spoke about um, so that you guys can review this on your own um, later on as you're, as you're going through these slides. Now, if your flavor of, of drawing inference is, is less p-values and more AIC, we can also see that AIC strongly favors the model that incorporates dependence, right? So for this AIC, we had 6626 um, versus an AIC back here of 6710. Um, so not even close. The AIC is much smaller for that um, model um, that is um, incorporating dependence between species, okay? So there we go. We've got our intercept only model looking at pairwise dependence between all three species. And we've worked a little bit on, on interpretation. Um, let's see here. I'm, trying, I'm gonna try to give it 10 more minutes so that we can have 15 minutes for questions. Does that sound about right? Okay. Um, okay, incorporating covariates. Um, it's important to note that any of those parameters that you include in your model can be a function of covariates and they don't have to be the same covariates. So literally for every element of your character vector, you can have a different covariate if you so choose, okay? Um, I realized just now that I, I, I didn't have, oh no, later on I do have multiple covariates, so, so, so never mind. Um, okay. Um, the, the syntax for including covariates on each of those models um, is similar to the syntax in, in other unmarked um, um, models as well, where we've got the tilde followed by the name of the covariate. Or if you wanted to include one as intercept only, you keep um, uh, just the tilde one for, for intercept only, okay? So any parameter can be a function of covariates. Um, covariate models for each of those parameters can be unique. Um, and then the names of those covariates correspond to um, either the, um, um, the, the element elements, the named elements of your detection covariate list or the columns in your site level um, covariates. Okay. Now I'll, I'll make a note that the, the model that I'm doing below is less biologically driven and more driven by me wanting to show you guys that you can have a different covariate for every single one of the parameters in your model. And some you can have as functions of covariates and some you can just have as intercept only, whatever you want to do, okay? Um, so we'll take this code down here, we'll throw it into our R session. We'll execute it. Is this one gonna take a little bit longer? Yep, the bigger your models, the, the more time they take to run. So be patient when fitting these if you're on a slower machine. So who, all right, we got a little bit more output here, okay? Um, this 
is where it becomes really, really important to make sure that you have named your species in your detection, non-detection list, so you can keep track of, of what's happening, okay? So um, this, for example, is our um, model for the first order natural parameters corresponding to Bobcat. So this is the model for the log odds that a Bobcat occurs at a site conditional on all the other species being absent. And from this one, we can see that there is a negative correlation between bobcat occurrence um, and disturbance within five kilometers. So the more disturbance, um, the less likely a bobcat is to occur uh, at a site. Similar interpretation for coyote um, and red fox. Okay. Now we can get at some of the cool things that the multi-species um, occupancy model does. This is, this is one of the strengths of this multi-species occupancy model relative to some of the others that you can throw in 40 species at a time. Because we can now evaluate how do these interactions vary along some sort of an um, environmental gradient, okay? So for this one, we are asking, how does um, dependence between bobcats and coyotes vary along latitude? I just threw that one in there uh, for the sake of example. Um, but it's cool that it came out as, um, as important in this model. So we'll, we'll take away two things from this output here. First, when latitude equals zero, okay, that's important here. When latitude equals zero, bobcats and coyotes are more likely to occupy the same site. We know this because we have a positive coefficient estimate here um, and it's highly significant, right? So we have a low p-value, 95% confidence intervals don't overlap zero, um, et cetera, okay? Moreover, we can say that as we move north, so as latitude increases, bobcats and coyotes are less likely to occupy the same site, okay? So that interaction varies along a latitudinal gradient, okay? Um, this is the same pairwise interaction for bobcat and red fox and for coyote and red fox. This is still saying that bobcat and red fox are, are unlikely to occupy the same sites and coyote and red fox are more likely to occupy the same sites. And these are um, conditional detection probability interpretation. Less interesting from a multi-species occupancy modeling context because you would interpret this exactly the same way you would say a single species occupancy model, okay? Um, and I have the more formal interpretations included in my slides here, um, okay? I kind of gave a colloquial interpretation earlier here, but this is more specific in terms of changes in law gods, um, et cetera. Right. Now, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the code um, for looking at for the data frame stuff here. Um, what, what, what's, what, what do I need to distill this to? Um, what I need to distill this to in the next couple of minutes is that the conditional occupancy probabilities that I talked about at the early, earlier in the talk and the marginal occupancy probabilities are implemented through the predict function, okay? Um, now the predict function for unmarked works like the predict function does for just about everything else in R, so I'm not gonna dwell on this in much detail here. The point of this slide is that um, we need to throw our covariates into a data frame. So if we wish to make new predictions over some, some gradient, just like with all the other predict functions in R, we need to throw those covariates explicitly into a data frame which is what I do here, okay? Here, what I'm trying to do is look at um, um, how occupancy probability varies along a latitudinal gradient, and I'm holding all of the other covariates at their mean, okay? And you know what? I should go back and just um, throw this into R real quick. Um, just, this is a data frame for making new predictions, okay? And now to calculate that conditional occupancy probability, we're gonna implement this within the predict function, okay? Um, and this is the same predict function that uh, most of you, or many of you that have used R for modeling are, are familiar with, okay? Um, so we specify that the, the model that we're making predictions from, 
Um, in the case of unmarked, we got this additional argument called type. This would either be state for occupancy or DET if we want to make predictions um, of detection probability. What's unique now for our multi-species occupancy models is what species do we want to make predictions on? In this case, it's going to be the bobcat, all right? I want conditional occupancy probabilities of bobcat. Furthermore, I'm going to tell predict that I want these to be conditional on coyote. Okay. So what is the probability a bobcat will be at a site conditional that a coyote was present at that site? Okay. I'm going to call this Bob underscore Koi one. So bobcat conditional on coyote being present can have some great syntax for telling the model that you want coyote to be absent. Okay, in this case, we still want the species to be the bobcat. We wanna look at conditional occupancy probability of bobcat, but now we wanna say conditional on coyote being absent, hence the minus coyote, okay? Conditional on coyote being present, conditional on coyote being absent, okay? So we have two different sets of predictions. This is just me visualizing these, okay? I'm not gonna dwell on this code here. This is um, this code here is for putting the predictions into a data frame for plotting in ggplot. Here's a nice little bit of ggplot code for making the graph that follows, okay? So here is a plot of Bobcat occupancy probability conditional on the presence of coyote and the absence of coyote. So let's note a couple of things here. First, if you guys remember, we saw that when latitude was zero, bobcats and coyotes were more likely to occupy the same site, okay? So we see at these lower latitudes that um, when a coyote is present, bobcats are much more likely to be present at a site, okay? We also see that as we increase in latitude, occupancy probability of bobcats declines at those sites where coyotes are present. They're still more likely to occur at a site if a coyote is there, um, but that positive dependence becomes weaker as we move up in latitude. Interestingly, this is a horizontal line here. If coyotes are absent, there is no relationship between um, um, presence and latitude. This might seem surprising at first, but if you remember the interpretation of that first order natural parameter, it's bobcat occurrence, when all other species are absent. That model did not include a coefficient for latitude. So we would not expect when all other species are absent, Bobcat's occupancy probability to change as a function of latitude, okay? And I think all of what I just said is summarized below this figure as you guys are reviewing this a little bit later. Okay, real quick, um, marginal occupancy probability. Now we just wanna get Bobcat all by itself. Okay, again, that is implemented within the predict function. If you want to get marginal occupancy probability, you just tell the predict function that you want the species to be the bobcat. You omit that COND argument. Okay, that's what I say right here. Omit the COND argument and you just get marginal occupancy probability of the bobcat and it's marginalizing over red fox and coyote. Okay. Remember that this is not that first order natural parameter. This is taking into account the presence or absence of those other species. Okay, here I am um, formatting that output for plotting in ggplot. And this is what a plot of marginal bobcat occupancy probability might look like, okay? Um, where we've marginalized over all the other species and we're just interested in looking at bobcat all by itself. All right. Breaking the model, all right. And then we'll get into questions um, and answers. I couldn't tell you how often uh, when I'm working with students on these models that their first inclination is to put every single covariate onto every single parameter and fit the model, okay? Um, this is just a simple case here, um, but I've seen much worse um, scenarios where all I do here is I model those interactions as a function of latitude and longitude, okay? 
Um, so what does that look like? How do you know if you've got a broken model? This is what that broken model will look like for you guys, okay? Um, in some cases, it can't even estimate those standard errors. Um, in other cases, you get standard errors that have an enormous uh, magnitude, okay? Um, and everything just um, looks hideous and you can't actually um, interpret a thing, okay? Um, now, this is, a, this, 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 is, this is occurring um, um, in large part because of a problem of separation and you can read about it in the paper that we've recently published. Um, and you can also read the solution in the paper that we recently published, which is the use of a penalized likelihood to shrink those um, coefficient estimates and those standard errors um, towards zero. You can read about the details in Clip It All uh, 2021. We just uh, published this recently um, in, uh, as a statistical reporting in ecology. I think it was in December. Um, and if you want to fix that broken model, we've got some code up here to do it. Um, basically, what we're doing here is applying um, a penalty that's shrinking those coefficients towards zero. The bigger the penalty, um, the stronger the shrinkage. This function can take a long time to run. Okay, I think it may have taken 15 minutes to run on my computer because it's a um, it's it's searching for an optimal penalty using cross validation. Okay, and then it'll fit your model. It'll fit your penalized model using that optimal penalty. Um, you guys can either fit it on your own if you downloaded the latest unmarked from GitHub, um, or you can download um, this fitted object from. Um, um, from the web because it was actually too big for me to um, put up on the GitHub uh, website, okay? But downloading um, um, this um, fitted model um, from the web and running it, we can now see that even that um, highly over-parameterized model, when we apply that penalty, we get much um, more reasonable standard errors. We can draw inference. Um, on all of these coefficients. The trade-off for that huge introduction, huge reduction in variance is a slight um, um, bias. You can read about that in our um, uh, statistical reports paper that uh, is linked to here um, as well. And then finally, we'll get at our continuous time multi-species occupancy model. I'll make a plug for this paper. This is still in press um, at Jabe's Journal of Agricultural, Biological, and Environmental Statistics. But basically, we take the same state model for our multi-species occupancy model, and we apply a Poisson point process to, um, to detections. And so we can model those detections in real time rather than binning them. And we can look at interactions both in space between critters, but also in time. And as you might see, if you were to look at this new paper, um, we find that um, when coyotes are present at a site, it actually changes um, um, activity patterns of, of white-tailed deer. Okay, um, so some pretty some pretty cool advances um, uh, for our multi-species occupancy models. And I think with that, I've got time for a few uh, questions. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, so. I'm going to read uh, some of the questions that are in pollav.com. So if you have questions, please uh, post there or upvote questions that are already there. Um, so I'm going to start with the one that's uh, highest up in the list here. How do graphically, visually, do you examine the degrees of freedom of the model to the data overlapping data points with model prediction? Yeah, so that's um, that's an excellent question. Um, um, visualizing um, predictions versus what you observe. So, so this is um, I don't think there's anything implemented in Unmarked to do this. Um, so this is likely something that you might have to do on your own. Um, the the challenge here, right, is that you have predictions that are bounded between zero and one. Um, and you have um, observations that are made on zero and one. Um, so if you wanted to, there's no reason that at, a, at, at the detection level, you couldn't plot those um, predictions. And remember in this case, the way you're gonna plot is not occupancy probability, 
but you're going to plot um, the product of occupancy probability and detection probability at a site. Okay. Um, so one could, um, in principle, make a visualization where you've got detection, non-detection at a site, ones and zeros, and then you could overlay on that the detection probability obtained from a fitted model um, if, if you wanted to, um, to inspect that. Um, there are, th this seems to be kind of a goodness of fit um, question um, as well. Um, and we've um, actually in an appendix of a, of a paper, we, but we've, we've published a, um, a, a goodness of fit test, um, you know, using a, a, a um, Pearson residuals. Um, um, and uh, if, if somebody reminds me, I could follow up um, and, and send that uh, appendix. Um, but we've derived methods for, for obtaining uh, Pearson residuals um, from, from a fitted model that you can use to compare um, um, observed with, with expected. Great. Yeah, I misspoke. I, I said degrees of freedom. And yeah, it's a, a degree of fit. Great. Great answer. Um, what are some of the things to consider when doing this in a Bayesian framework? Do you have any literature to recommend that we could look at? Yeah, um, I do have. OK, so Bayesian framework. Um, um, I love fitting it into Bayesian framework. And in fact, before we had the penalized likelihood, whenever my model would explode, I would just go fit it in a Bayesian framework. Um, and I would put, all you need to do is put some kind of a weakly informative prior um, on some of those slope coefficients. And that prior will do the same job as, as the shrinkage, as the penalty does in the, in the penalized likelihood. Um, um, Mark Carey's new book that I have on my bookshelf. Oh, I've loaned out the latest version. But I worked with Mark on version two of this book, um, and it has code for fitting, for fitting the multi-species occupancy model in, uh, in JAGS. So Applied Hierarchical Modeling in Ecology, volume two, um, plug for Mark's book. Um, I should say uh, Mark and Andy's book. Um, um, and there is um, starter code in there if you want to fit these models in a Bayesian uh, framework. Do, do you have any sort of follow following up on that question? When when should people use a marks versus trying to do it in Jags? Kind of, why why would we do one or the other? Yeah. Do you have any suggestions? Um, well, uh, a, a couple of thoughts come to mind. Um, first, if you guys wanted to do any kind of a random effects model, um, uh, Bayesian framework is the way to go. Um, I'm not. Um, sure of any um, method for fitting mixed effects models in a, in a frequentist framework um, for this multi-species occupancy model. So maybe you wanted a random site effect um, or, 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 or whatever. Um, if you wanted those random effects, um, use um, Bayesian methods uh, for sure. Um, another way you might want to, reason you might want to use Bayesian methods is if you need to apply some shrinkage towards your coefficients um, and maybe you're not soaked about doing this in um, uh, using a penalized likelihood, but you'd rather um, use Bayesian techniques. Um, applying a slightly informative prior on some of those coefficients that are tending to explode um, can, can deal with um, uh, some of those problems as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, let me see, the list keeps on changing here. Um, there was one question about uh, I think you, you showed some results when you talk about occupancy of bobcat given the presence of red fox or, or some other species, but can you make predictions on species Y conditional on different levels of density or abundance of species X? No, um, not in this implementation. Um, this is um, strictly um, conditional on presence or uh, or absence uh, of the other species. We reduce all of those detections during that replicate period um, into, uh, into a single week um, in this particular case. Um, but that more broadly, that's the way occupancy models um, um, in general work, maybe with the exception of those, some of those heterogeneity induced um, variation um, uh, in detection models. Um, 
in principle, I guess one could, but you would need to do more of an abundance model um, um, in that case. And, and I, I've not seen this multi-species occupancy uh, framework um, applied in an abundance context. It doesn't mean it's not there. Um, there's lots of things that, that happen out there that I don't see. Yeah, so maybe two more questions. Um, for conditional probability, are we averaging across all the abiotic environmental variables? Their variability may also influence species presence absence and not just presence of competitors. Yeah, so um, I, I, I hope I'll answer this question correctly. I'll go back to this um, conditional, conditional occupancy probability is what you were asking here. So um, basically what you're doing is when you're calculating conditional occupancy probability like I do here, is you're, you're calculating it lots and lots of times. And every time you're calculating it, you're slightly varying one of the other coefficients, okay? So for this one, for example, um, I've calculated conditional occupancy probability 100 times, okay? Every time I calculate conditional occupancy probability here, I keep everything else except latitude constant. And the only thing I'm tweaking in each of those 100 iterations is latitude. I'm letting latitude inch up, okay? Um, and in general, that's, that, that, that's how you do that. Um, and there's no reason um, that you couldn't calculate this conditional occupancy probability over any, any gradient or any combination of, of gradient that you want to, right? So there's no reason that you couldn't simultaneously vary this in two dimensions and make a nice three-dimensional plot. Um, but I um, tend to find things easier to interpret one variable um, at a time. And so for this one, everything else is held constant as I'm except latitude as I'm calculating that conditional occupancy probability. Yeah, I think that the question was uh, talking about, well, but as you vary latitude, does it, it, doesn't it impact the probability of coyotes being absent or present? And so, but I think the answer, your answer is just that, well, you, you fix it, you assume it's absent or present and you, right? Uh, oh, the I, yeah, I see, I see what you're getting at. Um, if coyote occupancy was influenced by latitude, then yes, indeed, this would account for that changing probability of coyote presence across latitudes. And um, those, some of those details are lost by having a nice function do this for you. Um, but if you were to dive into um, the meat of, of, of how those calculations are being made, um, um, it is including um, that um, coyote model, that bobcat model, and that interactive model. Yeah. So it is taking into account changes, um, how latitude might influence these other species that ultimately yes. influence bobcat. All right. Yep. Yep. And in fact, you know, whatever variable that you're 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 modeling here. It, it, it does, um, for all the species in your model, um, it accounts for how they change along that gradient. In this case, I'm pretty sure I didn't let coyote vary as a function of latitude. So this model assumes that coyote presence is unaffected by latitude. But if coyote presence was a function of latitude, sometimes these can take on some really cool shapes. They can like, a, you know, you just fit a linear model and then you got some nice, interesting J-shaped uh, responses precisely because of this uh, of, of this issue that it's simultaneously accounting for the how those other species are responding to this gradient. Great. Uh, last question then: um, When fitting your model to only two species, is it valid to include a covariate for for density of species one on co-occurrence of species one and two, and detection of species two? Yeah. Um, you could you could probably technically do it. Um, it's not something that um, it's it, it, it's not something that I would do um, because I feel like that is going to be um, well in, in in part you know that that density is going to be highly correlated perhaps with 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 presence or absence. There's not going to be independent information there. Um, and, um, 
And I think it's kind of a messy way to um, account for that, for that other species. Now, in terms of detection, something that I've liked um, to do, um, and we describe how to do this in the, um, in the original paper, is you can include latent presence or absence of that other species um, in the detection model. You got to do it by hand, and there's a good reason to go Bayes. Um, but it's perfectly valid to say, does bobcat detection change in a latent presence or absence of coyotes? Mm -hmm. 